We're going to be talking about OTP today. Uh, the title of this talk is OTP Has Done It, uh, a survey of wonderful things. This is a magical land, uh, and I'm excited to welcome you to it. Uh, my name is Nick DeBonner. Uh, I'm the CTO at a small startup uh, in a local government software space called Seneca Systems. Uh, and we are, as of I guess a couple weeks ago, now doing all greenfield development in Elixir, which we're really excited about. And uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, I'm kind of a cross Ruby and uh, Erlang native. Um, I'm coming from both those spaces on various projects. So I kind of wanted to talk about um, the, the different things that the OTP ecosystem has to offer to each of you. Um, I think that uh, you're going to find some stuff in here that's going to be really exciting for um, the, the work you're doing day to day. So the first thing I want to kind of uh, look at uh, are the principles that OTP was designed around. And really quickly, and this is the only time I'll mention it, but OTP stands for the Open Telecom Platform. Um, I didn't put it up there so that you could read it because I, I think often OTP gets short shrift because people assume that uh, it's somehow you know, only related to telecom applications. Um, in reality, that was where it was first developed, but uh, these are you know, common design implementations that we can use everywhere. Um, and the first, you know, and I think the most important principle is um, OTP is about separating uh, what is generic from what is specific. Um, what I mean by this is, oh, excuse me. What I mean by this is uh, it's very common for us in our industry to mistake uh, the challenges that we face as specific to our work, uh, to the domain problem that we're facing. Uh, when in reality, I think there's a large amount of shared technical um, uh, problem that we can um, use to, to address these, these things that we think are specific. And so OTP set out to basically say, look, we see these, these generic patterns of implementation across almost every software project that we develop. Let's turn them into something that is uh, you know, as easy to use as Legos to build, um, to build our, our little lands. And in OTP, every process um, is either a supervisor or a worker. Uh, this stuff is not complicated. It feels complicated from the outside. If you've looked at the Erlang docs, it's very easy to just get confused and lost and say, I, I really don't know what all this stuff is doing. Um, but the essence of it is, is that everything in the system is either a supervisor or a worker. And we're going to talk about what those things mean. Um, and applications, which are, um, we'll look at in a little bit, are basically just trees of processes. That's it. Uh, it's trees of supervisors and workers um, all doing their thing. Um, so it's not a complex, uh, complex concept. This is where to look if you're getting started on trying to figure out what is the philosophy behind this. Um, it seems a little ridiculous to have to put this up there, but the Erlang docs are spread out everywhere. And uh, I think if you're trying to figure out what something is about or how to use it, this is a good place to start. Um, and then I just wanted to throw this up there. Um, so this is a, a, a take on Greenspun's law that Robert Verding uh, came up with. But the idea is that, um, I mean, you guys can read it for yourself. But the idea is that if you spend your time, if, if you really spend your time um, trying to implement and reinvent uh, all the things that OTP has to offer, you're going to basically end up with this. You know, an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, and slow implementation, uh, basically about half of Erlang. Um, so if you take anything else away from this, it would be that uh, this should be sticking in your mind every time you find yourself saying, um, no, we probably need to write that in-house. Like, we need to write that from scratch. So the first of these principles is kind of, in my opinion, the most important. This is the gen generic versus specific um, uh, battle. And what I think I I've learned over um, a couple decades of, of doing this is um, your domain problem, that problem that you're trying to solve specific to your users, um, might be unique, it might not. Um, but much of the technical problem that you face, it's probably not unique. Um, there are pieces, that, most likely. But much of it is, uh, has been written by somebody else, and somebody else has had to sit there and think about this and build uh, a great, solid implementation of it. And, uh, and that's what OTP is all about, is like, what were those things that we could have shared, and let's, let's build them. 
This um this is a a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a tangent, but I uh, I see this happening more and more often in our industry, which is that we have a tendency to reinvent um, a lot of stuff um, that doesn't actually happen in in a lot of other disciplines um, around engineering, and this is not like a dig at like JavaScript or something like that. Um, but it is a dig at, at a tendency I think we have because we're all very curious people. Like I think you don't get into this, this particular profession unless you're a curious person who likes to build things. And part of it is that it's always a challenge to reinvent. And we like challenges. Um, it's really fun. Uh, it is an entertaining way to, to keep our brains occupied. Um, but I argue if you're building production systems, for the most part, and there's a mostly there to qualify this, um, it can be a waste. There's, of course, you know, always exceptions to this when you hit problems literally no one has faced technically. That's fine. Um, but I would like to see us reusing a little bit more. Um, and I think OTP provides a perfect gateway to, to getting into that new habit. This is a, a, a great metaphor I took from my, my um, mobile game days, which is um, there's, a, there's a great phrase in game development, which I'm not sure if you've heard. But it basically goes along the lines of, if you set out to make a game, which most people do when they're, when they're getting into game development, uh, you can either make a game engine or you can make a game. And the idea is uh, game engines are incredibly complex, incredibly complex. And you'll very quickly find your two years down the road with perhaps a great game engine, but you actually didn't get accomplished what you wanted. Um, if you're a company with huge resources, this might not apply because you have enough people that you can, you can weather that. But if you're a small team looking to move in a nimble manner, um, I think it, it behooves us to look at, are we building an engine here or are we trying to build the game itself? And lastly, um, if, if any of these abstractions that we're going to talk about here in the rest of the talk stop being useful to you, um, don't use them. You know, this is not, this is not uh, some sort of written in stone law, everything I'm writing up here. This is common sense of uh, these are abstractions we can use, we can take off the shelf and, and apply them to our problem. But if at any point in these you find yourself, you know, it's, it's getting painful, I say stop, look at, look at them for inspiration and build your own thing. Um, so this is sort of the caveat to the rest of the talk, I guess. And lastly, to sort of visualize that, um, I think for most of us this is what we end up thinking our problem looks like. Uh, where we have sort of the problem you face, the problem everybody else face, and then in the middle there in the overlapping section is the shared problem, the, sh the problem where we can share wisdom about it or code. Um, in reality, I think it probably ends up looking something like that, um, where the, the, the other problems people are facing and your problems actually take up a lot smaller space than you realize. Um, and it's really that shared problem in the middle that um, makes a community like this so exciting, right? This is a place where we can uh, extend that, and, or sorry, get those circles to overlap more. That, to me, is, is the secret to great productivity in this industry, is the more that I can make these circles overlap, the more I'm able to apply uh, our expertise to that tinier sliver, right? So ultimately, uh, if you're working on an Elixir system, I think it's, it's critical to ask yourself, um, uh, has the OTP done this thing that I'm, that I'm considering? The answer, probably. Um, it's not yes. It's not an unqualified yes. But the answer is probably. These guys, uh, the, these teams have built, this is a marvel of engineering in my opinion, OTP. And we're going to look at it, but it is a marvel of engineering. Uh, and people smarter than me spent a long time getting it right. Um, and I, I think uh, any time that I've looked, mostly, with a few exceptions, OTP has, has solved my problem. So the first thing I want to talk about is this notion of applications. Um, we hear it a lot. If you spin up a mix, um, uh, do a mix new with like the, the um, sub flag, you're going to get uh, an OTP application. And it can look a little overwhelming. You're, you're unsure of you know, where do things start, um, what are these uh, configuration files I'm looking at, what are these like, what is this version number four in this, in this uh, config EXS? And an application is just a piece of functionality that can be started and stopped as a unit. Okay? Uh, this is like systemd units, um, systemd controversial, but this is, uh, it's akin to that, right? An application is a piece of functionality that can start and stop um, at will, um, and they can be mixed together in OTP, uh, which is really nice as well. Applications are optionally reusable. 
there's two kinds. There's um, regular application, I don't remember what they're called, and library applications. And the idea is that library applications are those that don't actually actively manage any processes. Um, they are providing functionality to you from other places. So a lot of the dependencies that you mix into your projects um, are library applications in OTP. I would say, honestly, though, you don't actually need to worry about this a whole lot. Um, for most, the, the vast majority of projects, uh, the, OT, the application callbacks are done for you with Mix. Um, you, it Mix is a beautiful tool. You provide it that sub flag, and you get a supervised OTP application ready to go. It's really, really nice. Uh, I would say um, if you find yourself looking at your config EXS for your application and you're, you know, like, I, this is not doing exactly what I need, uh, look at conform. I think it's been talk, touched on a few times, and, and there was a great talk yesterday about it. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful tool that I have some big hopes for that I can talk a little bit about later. So supervisors. We hear this term get thrown out a lot. And when I first started Erlang, it was, I had no idea what these things were. They sounded like sort of magical uh, beings that ran and like terminated things at, at random. And suddenly I got fault tolerance for free kind of thing. Um, that isn't the case, but they are very simple to, simple to understand. They're basically responsible for starting, stopping, and monitoring all of your workers and other uh, supervisors. So in that tree of processes we talked about, supervisors are sort of the, uh, the managers, really, of the workers. Erlang was built to, it, with the understanding that, uh, OTP in particular was built with the understanding that the managers themselves will often fail. Um, so the idea of OTP is you are free to spin up as many supervisors as you feel necessary to achieve the fault tolerance that you're looking for. Um, and this can lead to some incredible, I, it was a revelation for me the first time that I properly structured an OTP app and realized that you can get things like self-healing and failover and um, all sorts of other really neat properties to your system um, just by setting up a, a small tree of supervisors. Uh, this is kind of confusing. When you do a supervisor, there's all these, like, they call them restart strategies. Um, they, I will tell you that um, you really just, most likely, unless you know otherwise, want to stick to these two strategies. One for one simply means that if a child process that the supervisor is uh, managing dies, it gets restarted, just that process. One for all means uh, if one child process dies, they all get restarted. Uh, typically, I think we use one for one for almost everything, and the rest we use one for all. Uh, supervisors, there's no real concept of uh, stopping a supervisor. You terminate at the root, and that termination trickles down through your tree of supervisors and gives them time to do proper cleanup or whatever they need to do uh, if you set your, your kill strategy that way. Um, I, I put their stopped in reverse start order. This is something that bit me a while ago with Erlang. Um, is uh, every once in a while you'll have an application where the termination of your supervisors depends on cleanup from some other one. And so it's just good to know sometimes if you, it, that they stop in uh, the reversed order that they're started in. And lastly, a child spec, you may have heard this term. A child spec is just a keyword list that we pass to a supervisor when we're adding a child. And it's just a set of uh, arguments that tell the supervisor, what do I do with this child? The start. Uh, keyword just tells it what's the function, uh, the module and function you want me to execute. Uh, restart is what kind of worker is this? Should it always be restarted? Uh, should it never be restarted? Um, should I restart it every once in a while? Shutdown is a key that just says, how do you want me to do this? You guys saw the brutal kill um, Adam earlier. That's, um, that's one of them. Uh, it's, it's just a means of like telling the supervisor, you can kill this thing right away, or I can be you know, patient with it and wait uh, for it to do some cleanup. And then type is either just a worker or supervisor. You almost never have to worry about this. It defaults to worker. So knowing that, let's talk about this, this, these gen flavors. Um, we hear these all over the community, and I think it can get very, very confusing about which you should be using when, uh, or even what they do, frankly. Uh, but in general, they all share some common properties. The first is that they're all generic implementations of common design patterns. Um, these are patterns that the developers of these um, libraries saw over and over in every piece of software that they built. 
um, and they wanted to encapsulate it in a, in a well-written form. These things are battle-tested at scales uh, you probably won't have to worry about hitting. Um, and if you do, you can rest easy. Um, I was telling a story in the, in the green room back there to some of the other speakers about uh, a mobile game that I had with like two and a half million users at one point on concurrently for a, for a special event. And um, the, the, the system basically never, like I couldn't even pin, like max out the, the instances that it was running on. Um, and we're talking like rock solid implementations here. You use these via behaviors. Uh, note the British spelling. Um, these are uh, implemented in callback modules. It's essentially just a set of functions that you define according to this behavior that'll get called by the system automatically. Um, and we'll look at what some of those are. Um, but they're very easy to implement. It's like an interface, kind of. Um, and so it's very easy to get started. The uh, sort of uh, king of the gen land is the gen server. Uh, gen server is I would argue forms probably the basis of like 90% of Erlang code out there that's in production. Um, it encapsulates the request response cycle um, that we see on almost every form of interaction between users and systems and systems and systems. Um, you know, one thing that you're going to start thinking about is if you land yourself on an Elixir stack, um, microservices get way easier. Um, it becomes much easier to split your code out because you're just basically throwing up gen server interfaces everywhere. Um, so it's very efficient, very fast, and very maintainable. There's two forms of interactions that gen server uh, supports. Um, that's the synchronous interaction. That's the request response cycle. Uh, you use those via uh, genserver.call, and you pass that a PID or name of the gen server you want to um, call out to. And then in the gen server, you just set up a handle call uh, callback function. And all that does is take in the message that you're looking for. You do some work on it, and you return, some, you return a reply. And OTP will take care of the, the whole rest of that process. One way is, uh, using, is called cast. And it works the exact same way, except there's no expectation of a reply. Uh, so we can use this for asynchronous actions. Gen server is what you want to reach for, I would say, almost all the time. Uh, we're going to talk about the other two implementations, but um, if you find yourself trying to fit those into what you're doing, I would say just go back to Gen Server because it does a whole lot. And in fact, the next one is built on top of Gen Server. And I really encourage you to go and look at the code for this. Very lightweight. The code for Gen Server itself is actually very readable. Um, but uh, but these are but Gen FSM, uh, which I'm going to talk about next, is basically just a specialized version of Gen Server. And all it is is finite state management as a process. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are following the mailing list recently, but there was a big uh, talk discussion about a, uh, Gen FSM and whether it might be better to split things out into a data component of the state machine and a process component of it. Um, I'll leave that for uh, more creative minds. I will say that I've used this in many large production systems, and it is highly maintainable and very elegant, in my opinion. Um, all it is is a, a process that goes from state to state using what it calls events. And uh, those are uh, either asynchronous or synchronous. Um, and basically, all you do is uh, define a set of callbacks in your state machine that match on whatever the current state of that uh, FSM is, and then match on that uh, event that you're passing in. So for example, in this FSM, if we're in the uh, pending state and an approval event gets sent into the um, gen FSM, this function will be called. It's very easy to follow the logic. Um, it's composable. You can move this into multiple um, you know, modules and states. Uh, and, and we actually use this to do, um, well, actually, this will be going into production soon. but. Um, uh, a set of interactions with old government systems. So at Seneca, we work with a lot of local governments that are, there's like COBOL systems and things like that that we have to um, interact with for passing data like into a 311 system or something like that. And there's tons of failure modes, tons of them. Um, they have like business hours for the servers. Um, I'm not kidding. Uh, and so you want to have a way of spinning up, and we spin these up for each of the 
the processes that comes through, we spin up a gen FSM, a way of encapsulating those failure modes and recovering from them gracefully, very gracefully. Um, and they're, they're really easy to write. Gen event, uh, this is kind of a controversial uh, gen flavor. Um, basically, this is the, the only one of them that you don't directly really spawn. Um, you spawn an event manager. And I, and I also want to say for a second, event here has a connotation, I think, in, when we're speaking about it in modern terms, that probably doesn't apply to the way you think about it here. Um, it was, these are not, these are blocking calls, for example, um, when you do this. You can do asynchronous events, but um, the event manager will block while it runs uh, on that, on, in some cases. Um, however, it is very easy to use. You spin it up at one point in your tree. Uh, at any time, you can add a handler, and this works similarly to any other sort of event handling you've ever used um, from an from a ergonomics point of view. It's, uh, you give it a, a module and a function, and um, what will happen is basically throughout the rest of your code, you can just make callouts to that gen event manager and say, hey, this thing happened, execute whatever handlers are, are waiting for it. Um, the, the, great, the great use case for this is logging. Um, the, I, I would say that unless you absolutely know that you're, you need to reach for this, I wouldn't worry about it. There's a lot of edge cases involving concurrency here that um, will get you in trouble. Uh, but it's really powerful when it, when it fits right. And also, uh, act notify. Um, this isn't really spelled out, I don't think, anywhere. But like, act notify it is a safer version. There's basically three notifies. Um, I think it's act notify, notify, and sync notify. Uh, notify does a cast and doesn't um, apply any back pressure to the, to the um, event manager. Uh, act notify, on the other hand, will wait for the event manager to acknowledge an incoming event, and then we'll run it asynchronously. So I suggest going with the, with the act notify if possible. And that's what that is. So kind of moving away from the um, gen flavors for a moment. Uh, one of the common things that we face, especially in web infrastructure, are the, the need for sort of uh, ephemeral storage components. Uh, the ability to basically sit something in a performant cache uh, that can be distributed and talked to by multiple nodes um, without having to introduce a third party um, process into the loop. Um, and ETS is, is, the, is Erlang's answer to this. This is uh, an Erlang term storage. Um, it's for storing arbitrary Erlang terms, so binaries or lists or tuples or whatever you want to store in it. Um, it's key value. It's very easy to use. And uh, it can be introduced into your process management uh, tree so that you're, you're never worried about it sticking around uh, beyond what you want to, although as we'll find out, it might disappear sometimes before you want it to. Um, but, uh, but this is a really powerful tool. And essentially it comes in these four forms. One is called the, the set type, and this is the default. And this is essentially uh, unique keys to unique values. Uh, or actually, sorry, unique keys. And uh, you can also specify that you want an ordered set, which is uh, going to be ordered keys. A bag, which allows you to have duplicate keys, but not duplicate values. Uh, and then a duplicate bag, which will be duplicate keys and possibly duplicate values for those, for those duplicate keys. Um, I find myself reaching for set and sometimes ordered set um, to duplicate some of the stuff that Redis can do every once in a while. Um, but uh, I, I honestly haven't gotten a whole lot of um, use out of the bag or dupl duplicate bag. Um, settings on this, although we were talking about it might be useful for time series storage to, to use a bag. Um, they come with these kind of uh, difficult to understand but really easy to use options for optimizing them to your use case. If you know that your ETS table is going to be read heavily, pass it the read concurrency uh, true flag. Uh, if it's going to be read multiple processes. If you know it's going to be written to a lot from a lot of different processes, pass that flag. And basically, Erlang behind the scenes will optimize the ETS for those use cases. Uh, they come at overhead if you're not using it for the correct use case. But uh, I think you can figure out whether you need that or not. They have three access modes. Uh, there's the public mode, which basically says it can be written to or read by any process that's within um, the tree or accessible that can access that node. 
it comes with the protected access, which says that this uh, ETS table is readable by anyone, uh, but writable only by the managing process. And, and usually that's a, what you kind of want for like a cache, so you stick it like a gen server in front of it, and then that process uh, man fully manages your, your cache store. And then there's also a private mode, which says that the managing process is the only one that can read or write to the ETS table. This is probably the most important thing to understand about ETS. The, the process that spins it up is going to destroy it when it terminates. So if you have a child process that owns an ETS table and you wanted that ETS table to persist when that child process dies, don't spin the ETS up inside that process because it will kill it on its way out. This, one of the difficulties I faced in this talk was OTP is such a broad ecosystem of libraries that I didn't really know uh, how to do it justice in the time you know, allotted here. And I really encourage you to go look up Amnesia. Basically, this is a, a relational database built on top of ETS uh, with all the power of ETS and a lot of the cons as well. Uh, look at it for your use case. I, I would say it's probably easier for people coming from the Erlang community to sort of understand its query language, but it's very powerful. Um, it's a full relational database, has query language, um, foreign key constraints, I think, and uh, it's very powerful. So check it out if you get a chance. Releases. So OTP releases are one of those things that I really wish we'd be talking about more. Uh, they are so powerful, so incredibly powerful. And I'm going to say, I had a whole lot written on this, and then I saw Paul's talk yesterday, and I realized, basically, you should just do yourself a favor and watch his talk. Um, it was an incredibly eye-opening uh, experience, for, I know, for a lot of people to see what these things are capable of um, and what's been done for us. But, you know, generally an overview is that we're talking about completely self-contained uh, artifacts uh, for, your, for your application. Build it, you get a release artifact, a tarball out of it, put it on a server, run it. It's that easy. Comes with the entire uh, Erlang runtime system by default uh, embedded inside of it. It is absolutely incredible and um, I can speak as a, as a you know, we have a very small team um, running at Seneca right now, and I can say that these things save my life on many occasions because it just it makes fixing uh, bugs so much easier um, for what you would think would be a very complex deployment process given OTP's power. They're highly configurable, and basically they're highly configurable, and we saw this with Conform. It, you can make these things do anything you want, um, and. Hot upgrades and downgrades. So this is kind of interesting because I know, for me, this was really exciting. Um, but I understand, and I've talked to a lot of people who have said, well, I, my, my applications aren't very stateful. Uh, I run fairly stateless applications. Hot upgrade, it doesn't really matter if the system's down for a little bit. I'd argue two things about that. One is I think applications are moving. Um, we, we saw the keynote about the pendulum. I think applications are moving to needing at least some state handling on the back end. And I think, uh, I think while you can get away with throwing stuff out on, on say, a restart, I kind of look at it as like, let's, let's evolve the, the state of the industry a little bit. Let's expect this kind of uh, hot upgrade to become the standard for how we deploy code. Um, it's about time, I feel like. This is an incredibly powerful means for holding on to your, your application state, not disconnecting people um, at random times when you're doing maintenance or whatever. And part of this is that all of the gen flavors that I talked about support this really magical little function that never gets looked at called code change. Code change is just a callback uh, behavior, or a, a callback on the behavior that takes in uh, the old state of the application when this function was called and is expected to return the new state of it. This gets called during one of the hot upgrades or during a hot downgrade. And it's incredibly powerful. You can essentially take, for example, you could have uh, a stateful map of connections or something like that. And then you could literally change the entire logic of the way those connections are handled. And then you're, you're just going to write a migration inside this code change function that's going to take the old map that you were holding around, return the new map, and all of your systems will make that migration seamlessly and in real time with no downtime. I mean, it's really neat to see it, to see the first time you do it. And I highly recommend it for anybody who's doing any sort of real-time application where you're dealing with persistent connections. 
quickly, I want to talk, uh, touch on this, this really neat feature, which um, doesn't get a lot of play. It's the fact that um, in an OTP release, you can specify the nodes that you want to be on sort of hot standby for your application. So you can say, when I start this up, I want to start a node at this uh, host name, and uh, it's going to be the primary. And then I want to have these two hot standbys. And their job is to, to be started, but they're not going to be getting the traffic from, from, um, from, the, rest of the, from the rest of the way that the tree trickles down. And um, at any time, if one of those nodes goes down, and you can configure what that means, how quickly or um, how much of a chance you want to give it to come back up. Basically, early OTP will automatically fail over to one of your hot standby nodes. And uh, when your node comes back, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so it's configured as part of the release. And um, when your node comes back from failure, it goes back. It gives control back to that original primary node. So you can have self-healing, basically, topologies for your applications with little more than a few configuration steps. That comes with a little asterisk because it, it can be difficult to any sort of distributed uh, failover can be di difficult to configure. But I encourage you to look into this to see if it's an option for you. So having said all that, I kind of want to talk about um, my dream uh, infrastructure uh, because I think we're really close to it here with Elixir. What I really want, at Seneca, for example, we have a lot of legacy uh, systems that are on they're not legacy. They're, they're in use, um, but they're on legacy languages. Uh, they, we have a lot of systems that we need to keep running, but I would really like to be able to have the power of OTP supervision structure over even third-party uh, you know, processes. And um, I think this could be just absolutely incredible. Um, I know I was talking with the CargoSense guys about what they're doing and um, how they're starting to see the power of OTP releases and, and kind of questioning that their decision of looking at Docker um, as their move. Because I actually think done right, you could build a, a complete deployment infrastructure configuration management system on top of OTP that would blow your mind away. Um, I think that ports can be used to get a lot of this out of it. Um, it's they, I know that they can be used to manage third-party processes and restart them when they die. So I'd really love to see somebody take an attempt at, at building the supervision tree that sort of mimics, you're not going to get all of it, but sort of mimics the supervisor structure as it sits today. I'm going to basically take all the hard questions and pass them off to uh, James Smith, who's going to be giving a talk um, later today uh, on, on interoperability. Uh, we we kind of went back and forth on this, and um, He's going to be the expert for, the, for how, how to do this. But I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, the first person to build this will have uh, one of the Phoenix-like apps in the, in the Elixir ecosystem, if it's done right. To kind of take it way, way out there, um, I'm not sure how many people have seen this, this demo. But this is essentially um, an Erlang VM written on top of, uh, as a unikernel for, the, um, for a hypervisor. Oh, that's somebody out there. Um, and uh, what it does is it, it basically spins up a complete hypervisor VM um, for every request. Go to this website. It will blow your mind how quickly it runs. And um, sort of I was thinking about my dream, and I thought, man, what if, you could, what if you could just get rid of the OS altogether and you could run an OTP infrastructure on top of a hypervisor, um, spin it up, scale it up and down with new nodes that, with self-healing due to failover, like that. Um, then I think you're kind of, you're, you're competing with like Kubernetes or something like that, which gets really exciting. So um, yeah, somebody get to it. Finally, I uh, just want to recap real quickly. Um, OTP is about awesome implementations of common design patterns. Look to it anytime you're looking for something that uh, you, you have a suspicion somebody else has had to tackle before, which is probably most things. We've got robust ephemeral storage options here. And if it, you need something a little bit more than ephemeral storage, check out DETS as well. So DETS is basically a disk version of ETS that you can use to flush ETS tables to disk every once in a while. Um, it's certainly not, uh, it's, it's very robust in the use cases that it was designed for, but it comes with a lot of um, caveats. So just check it out if it, if it interests you. We have a really powerful deployment story. I think the most powerful deployment story of any language, even more powerful than Go, in my opinion. And Go is pretty hard to beat, given how self-contained it is. But with the monitoring and fault tolerance we're talking about, I think it blows it out of the water. 
And lastly, when you're rolling with OTP, you very quickly figure out all the other platforms in your stack end up as the failure points. Uh, in fact, it's almost depressing because you want to be writing more Elixir, but it, it works. It just works. And, you know, this was, this was another thing that um, Ben and Bruce for Carcass Sensor told me is they were like, yeah, we, we, rolled, we got all this uh, OTP stuff going, and then it ended up being the Docker daemon that we had to watch all the time because that was where the, basically where the failure abstraction went. And um, I think that's incredible. I think it's really exciting. Uh, so, yeah, that's the end of the talk.